by the time I was uh, had started playing guitar, which was in the mid fifties, either nineteen fifty four or nineteen fifty five, there was no uh, lead bluegrass guitar as we know it. I mean, Earl Scruggs had done some finger picking guitar with Vladimir Scruggs, and uh, of course Don Reno played some incredible lead guitar with uh, the Reno and Smiley group of years ago, and then there was George Shuffler. The Stanley Brothers had featured with some lead guitar playing, but but uh, guitar playing at that point was considered, um, I don't want to use the term novelty, but it, it, it was very rarely featured. And it wasn't until Clarence White came along that anybody that heard him play, automatically their ears perked up and they thought, wow, this is this is a whole new dimension of, of guitar playing right here. This, this uh, shifts the definition of of uh, a dreadnought guitar in bluegrass. Mm. This shifts the entire definition and, and makes an, uh, a totally different instrument in its own right from just a lead in, or just a rhythm instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was did you just, first hear, hear Clarence? I first heard Clarence White uh, when I was on. Uh, I did a radio show. I was. Uh, this was in 1959. Uh, and I was eight years old, and I, uh, I did a, I will, I will never forget this, I did a Buck Owens tune called Under Your Spell Again. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I went over and did this radio show that was in Los Angeles, and it was a show called Town Hall Party. And there was only blue, one bluegrass band in the Los Angeles area at the time, was then called the Country Boys, later called the Kentucky Colonels. And it was Clarence and Roland White and uh, Billy Ray Latham and uh, Eric White on bass and uh, Leroy McNeese on Dobro. And um, they were called the Country Boys. Anyway, I heard them and, and I had, had only been exposed to uh, the bluegrass music of Flatt and Scruggs and, and uh, Reno and Smiley, Stanley Brothers, um, Jim and Jesse, even people like that. The, the, uh, more predominant bluegrass bands. Anyway, uh, you can imagine me at eight or nine years old hearing this kid of 15 or 16, which was Clarence White, right. you know, uh, playing guitar the way he was. I mean, uh, he became an instant idol. Uh -huh. you know? Can you show some of what Clarence, what made his playing different uh, <clears throat> without going specifically into a, a, an actual note for note solo of Clarence, but just something that he might have done? Um... That, that's one of Clarence White's intros, uh -huh. for example, to... Uh, Play that one more time, just a little slower. Oh, great. Yeah, I think that's on the, uh, the Weisberg Brickman album. Uh, oh, is it? That uh, Clarence White played on the one. You remember that from yeah, back in the early 60s? I do. It was an intro. New Dimensions used. and Bluegrass yeah, that's Banjo? It. Yeah, that's it. Yep. That was one of the uh, one of the things that Clarence played. But um, there were so many other other things. Like a while ago when I played Wildwood Flower, mm -hmm. um, the, the simple uh, Carter family way of playing that would be... Clarence White came along and would put in uh, something like that. Exactly like you would play it, but you can you can get the idea of uh, you know there's some little cross picking things in there and and mm -hmm. placing emphasis on on different notes and uh, syncopated yeah. notes things like that, that that Clarence White I think I think it uh, it just came came to him naturally also I don't think it's, I think it was just his way of doing it uh -huh. and nobody told him to play that way he just he, he just did it. It's interesting because a lot of it sounds like a lot of the um, melody notes suddenly come on the upbeat when you 
picking. You, Some, sometimes it that, is. Um, or the upstroke, too, when you when you if you play it again, you'll see the see, um, Sound like that, yeah. That's a rather crude version, but maybe you can can right. get the idea. And I tried for a good many years to to play like that, to play like Clarence White. Um, and then, of course, I found out I couldn't do it. And and then uh, I would I would catch myself playing something like, well, maybe I can get as close to the way you would play it as I can. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that came my own sound. And that process just kept repeating itself over the years till I, I got to where I had my own musical identity as a result of that. And uh, while still retaining that respect and ad admiration for Clarence White that uh, I will always have. Uh -huh. Well, that's probably what, what anybody listening to this uh, video or, and trying to learn this stuff uh, should take away is that you, you glean what you can and, and then incorporate it into other things you hear and other styles and come out with something of, of your own. Exactly. Um, there, are, there are a couple of, of, of Clarence White, I, I should call them practitioners out there. Um, I know David Greer uh, probably mm -hmm. knows more about uh, Clarence White note for note than any other guitar player, or Russ Berenberg also. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though they know and have studied Clarence White and, and they know his technique probably as good as anybody else. They also each have their own individual musical identities. Right. You know, they, they can do both. So, uh, One of Clarence's best known uh, tunes, I think, was, was his version of Nine Pound Hammer. And I know you do a version of that too, right? I've recorded that a couple of different times. Many times, yeah. yeah. 